You are listening to iRadio TT online all the time. Welcome to Music Matters, the Caribbean edition. The podcast series featuring news, interviews and analysis of all the music from the islands. Hi everybody, I'm Nigel Campbell. And I'm Laura Dowrich Phillips and you're listening to Music Matters. The Caribbean edition. Yeah. And we're back once again talking about the business of music in the Caribbean. Yes, we are, Nigel. And today, today we have a very exciting follow up to our a previous June conversation yes, that we, we had. About, yes, we spoke about the live music industry in the Caribbean. Yes, and which which ma- caused a bit of a stir. A minus still we spoke. Mm. We had some comments about the live music district. Mm-hmm. Um I was told personally off air that we were one sided and I said, Well, you know, we, we will get sooner or later the other side of the story and i believe today we have the other side we of the have story. the other side so joining us today is melissa jimenez i'm not, I'm not sure if i pronounce that Jimenez. correctly <laughs> people she will correct us and she is the general manager of music tt and she'll be here to talk about the live music district which has entered its second phase out of, out of the pilot phase and now into i guess a, a kind of rollout according to the minister of trade yes so melissa Welcome to Music Matters. Thank you very much for having me, Laura and Nigel. You're welcome, <laughs> and thanks you for being here. So, Melissa, the last time we spoke back in June, it was Nigel? I think so. June is when we spoke about our other thing, about what made sense and what didn't make sense. Right. So, we were reviewing the live music district based on feedback we got from artists, based on our own experience, me, Nigel, more than me, because he... You know, bachelor life now. He could go. Bachi, he could yeah. go. He could go out <laughs> late nights and things. Oh, last, last, somewhere jamming. Eh? Last time we edited that out, but I noticed it's back in. <laughs> but what are you gonna do? So, so we are gonna do? Where are you gonna do? Go ahead, now, So we we, we had a conversation about live music district and and what we felt with the shortcomings, um, the execution of it, which we were not really impressed with, um. Some of the issues we encountered, such as venues not willing to pay the extra, you know, for, for more performance time from the artists. And, and the general uptake by the, by the venues. I mean, I, I could, I remember the minister and certainly John Arnold, the chairman of Music TT said about 60 plus venues who had come on board. And, uh, was it 31 venues? 31. 31 venues. I apologize. But um, in terms of those venues being converted into what I'd call a live music space, I haven't seen that. But right, uh, Laura will continue. So during the budget, um, the finance minister, Colm Embert, announced that the live music district will be entering phase two and was a success. So Nigel and I, you know, had comments to make on Facebook, which I think rattled some people. Nigel my name, name get called up. My name in get called in Hansard in Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> I get called on TV to talk oh, about Lord. this thing. Right. So, which is why we wanted you here to, 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 cause we didn't have an official, you know, discussing the live music district with us the last time. So now you are here mm-hmm. and uh, we have entered phase two. So tell us and, you know, our listeners, what is going to be different in phase two from phase one? So the only difference between phase two and phase one is that the way that we are engaging the venues in terms of how they hire the artists. So in phase one, (laughs) venues were allowed to um, have multiple artists um, in a hopes that they would catch on and that they would appreciate it and eventually pay the artists, etc. So it was more of an onboarding process kind of thing. Um, in terms of enticing them with the artists. Um, but in phase two, we're allowing the first performer. So Laura goes to, um, Radisson to perform. Radisson wants Laura to perform. Laura is going to go there for the first time. Music TT will pay for that 20 minutes. If they are not extending, if they're extending, they pay for the extra time. And if they are wowed by Laura's performance and they want Laura again, they foot the entire bill of that cost. Um, 
One, because financial constraints as it be, we don't have the money to essentially fund all those artists' performances for, on a long-term basis, um, which is why we're hoping that the venues are encouraged enough to take on this project. You know, the private sector needs to take it over and run with it. The government can't afford to sustain that long-term. The money done. Um, <laughs> the money done. And <laughs> um so yeah, that, that is the hope for this second phase that the venues will take it more seriously as a business in terms of, you know, hiring the artists and understand what we're really trying to build here. So when you all so, assessed phase one, was that the major issue for you all coming out of that? That you all had to address? Because that was our, one of our peeves that, you know, how are we really encouraging building any kind of live music district if the venues weren't willing to invest in the artists? That was, you are correct, that was one of the, um, one of the major things that came out for us in phase one because, um, as Nigel mentioned earlier, we had about 31 venues and out of that, we probably had about five to eight venues paying artists. So for extra time, um, the flip side to that, though, is that a lot of the artists also called us up to follow up and say that because of their gigs at Hilton or because of their gigs at here, where, wherever, other business persons contacted them and wanted them to perform um, at their venues um, or at their functions or their business events and whatever, whatever. So LMD so, became, LMD became a, a kind of booking agency, but I understand the Live Music District was about building an, an area, certainly for this being that fact, initial caption area, as a space where potentially tourists will come to, to recognize, okay, this is a space where the music. So I, I'm thinking that venue uptake would have been a primary focus more so than Artists, yes, artists getting gigs. Let's not deny it. It's all about the artists. Mm-hmm. But in terms of convincing venues to come on board, how difficult was that? I'm guessing um, it was. Five out of 31 doesn't seem like a great percentage. Initially, it was not difficult. We also had some clubs and stuff that came on, but for whatever reason, they didn't activate. Mm-hmm. So we had to find replacements for them mm-hmm. um, with other tea houses and um, restaurants, etc., other mm-hmm. other spaces within Port of Spain to make up for for their, I don't know, backing out. I'm not sure why. Um, we're still yet to talk to the venues and the clubs and find mm-hmm. out why exactly why they, out. they yeah they weren't activating as they should. So um, backtracking to the first part of your statement with the booking agency. So a lot of people have the misconception that Music TT is booking for these artists and venues. We're not. I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are essentially, we have provided a platform called Music, mm-hmm. which pairs the venues and the artists. So the venue signs on to this Music platform mm-hmm. as a venue owner and the artist uploads their electronic press kit mm-hmm. and as an artist. So what happens is the venue is going to now scan through this roster of artists, yes. EPKs, mm-hmm. and they're going to say, oh, let me listen to Nigel's um, links. Mm-hmm. And they say, okay, yeah, I really like this vibe. I'm feeling him. Let me hire him. They click on Nigel and they request a booking. Mm. And the artist now is supposed to respond and, you know, have a conversation with the venue, which most of them don't. Um, they just leave it up to the venue to do whatever. Mm-hmm. So I guess that part is definitely teaching the artist and both the venue um, how to interact in that space. In that you would find some venues, well, we found that some venues like two days before the performance mm-hmm. would send a request to music for an artist. Mm-hmm. And we're like, no, it can't work that way. You know, mm-hmm. you need to give them time. They have to prepare their sets. Yeah, they yeah. have to... You know, prepare themselves for your performance. There's not a today for tomorrow kind of thing. One of the things so. that we said back in our June podcast was the idea that that is a deficiency among the artists, the actual business of, right. in terms of how to engage and how to interact. Yes, before there was a live music district, artists were still getting jobs. But certainly, um, it didn't seem as though a number of these, especially these younger artists who seem to be on board with the LMD in terms of those who were registered and those who seemingly were talking about being a part of mm-hmm. it. They didn't seem to have, well, uh, the, the tools, the professional tools right. that would move them forward in the music industry. They can all sing. They're all talented. They, they look good, that kind of stuff. But the the way that they engage and that it's it's not a kind of 
a de facto way of doing business here. Mm-hmm. They go online and request a booking and then the artist has a conversation. That doesn't, doesn't seem to be the norm as yet. So mm-hmm. I, I understand it's a learning curve and I'm assuming by this second phase, they've already understood how to do that. It's, are you constantly training them in terms of the business of bookings and the business of performance? Not so much the business of performance, sorry, but the business of engaging for a performance. And negotiating. And negotiating. Yeah. Yeah. So we did notice that for phase one. Mm-hmm. Um, more so me because I was heavily involved in administering that project myself. So what I tried to do in phase one was um, send out like uh, email to the database of artists, you know, ever so often giving them tips on how to engage with these venues. Um, for phase two, this may not happen depending on time, um, but we actually wanted to have a session with the registered artists before granted i know all 200 and something of them are not going to attend (laughs) but ideally we would like those registered artists to attend and we have a session with them and some of the venues also volunteered to be like panelists for that discussion so they understand what the venues want Mm -hmm. and they understand that the artists what their responsibility is Mm -hmm. so for example one thing that came up was um we had a fine dining restaurant Mm -hmm. um in phase one and then you have artists coming wearing apparel that was not (laughs) befitting of a of a fine dining restaurant i I actually know that case (laughs) (laughs) i know that was that case directly from one of the principals they're Mm. like melissa um we need to talk to the artists about. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually heard about that. what to wear, etc., mm-hmm. etc. Et when they come to this establishment, you know, mm-hmm. it's different from the others. And same goes for like Hilton and Radisson and stuff so, like so that. So it's music business so, one on one. I mean, as much as and, and, and this is my other pet peeve besides our website and Laura and I will talk about that is that we have the strategic plan which the ministry has cherry picked and picked these four elements: artist development, online platform showcase and LMD and vis-a-vis and it seems as though we are assuming that we have a, a pool of business savvy mm-hmm. artists <laughs> yes and we don't seem to have that so they literally have to go music business one on one music TT has a role and I'm not sure if one of those roles is to teach people how to sing how to perform how to do business is that one of the functions of music TT not the how to sing and how to we 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 can't deal with that nitty gritty fundamental mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, we may touch on it in some of the workshops and conferences and because you're like doing that. capacity building and that yeah. had last yeah. year, the year before, loads and loads of how to produce a song and how to make a video and right. And remember, mm-hmm. the end point to this is export activity. So we're looking more at the intermediate artists to the expert artists already that that trying to bridge into export activity being the main goal because the whole goal of Music TT is to try and generate revenue for our music industry. So get our artists self sufficient enough to and pay taxes. be able and pay taxes. But Thank the, but, you. But, but, <laughs> but here's the thing Thank though. You. Like I and then sometimes I wonder maybe with all these plans that we when we're implementing, if we're putting the cart before the horse, because it seems to me like we need to start at the basics with these artists. And before we start doing live music district and start trying to to groom them for export, it seems like we need to just recognize that we don't really we have what we have is a bunch of really talented people but that's it <laughs> you know we don't have that's it. they have no business savvy they don't understand how to market themselves they don't know how to negotiate they don't understand the importance of proper headshots or proper right. marketing tools so is it that we needed to just really build an a proper industry by starting at that level of just level playing field whether or not you're a big name because we have big names who don't own their own domain oh god who don't have Laura, who don't Laura, have Laura, professional Laura, photos Laura, Laura. <laughs> Laura, Laura. <laughs> you know, we have a website <laughs> every time we, we do a podcast yeah. we talk about Tell me, this ask so, the question, do you have a website and people say no right so we have big names who who out there getting gigs touring but they don't have like just don't have basics people just don't understand the 
why they need a website? Everybody doing everything on Instagram. I literally had that website discussion with a few <laughs> artists just last week, and they were like, they don't see the point in having a website. I say, okay, let me let me put. How this can they not <laughs> see the point? Listen, listen, <laughs> Melissa, wait, Melissa. Wait. All right, I'll go with it. I'll go let me it. let me put this in context for you. So my experience, um, uh, well, not so long ago, a year ago, with some students from China. Mm-hmm. And uh, students from Vietnam, they don't regularly have access because of how their government controls their system mm-hmm. to the rest of the outside world when it comes to technology. So they censor a lot of things for them. Yeah. They have to create their own apps for you to actually, you know, get to speak with them and stuff. Mm-hmm. So some of them, I remember, were trying to register for school and stuff while they were home and they couldn't do it because the government was blocking emails and stuff. But the only thing they could do is get access to the website. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing they could do and try and get whoever on this website to contact them because they weren't able to contact the offices. Wow. So I put that forward to them and I was like, if you're trying to hit China, which is one of the biggest markets ever. And one of it is the biggest market. <laughs> well, the biggest. And then India is the second. Yeah. India, yeah they right? have no access to and social <laughs> media, no, no Facebook, no, no nothing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And things are being, you know. So, so how do you expect to hit that market without a website? What? It's like, why Why would you not have a website? And then the other part of that, the flip side to that, is trying to get them to understand that they are a company. You know? You you, you are a company. From the time you decide to be Laura, an artist and Laura, grow out there, you're Laura, a company. Laura, 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 where was Melissa Jimenez? Jimenez. <laughs> a year ago. Listen, I am where nodding so me? hard. My yeah. head is about to fall off. Fall off. Where is this? Anyhow, keep going. Let me know. Because I, I, told, I remember telling an artist, I say, what happens when Facebook, if Facebook and Instagram and Twitter goes down? Exactly. What when happens? They, when they you change don't own the algorithm. Your content. Yes, exactly. you don't own There's There's not a major artist in the world who does not have a website. Exactly. Like, Rihanna has a website, man. The, there was a soccer <laughs> artist that I was talking to that he, he's getting some traction here and whatnot. And what he does is passes all his stuff when I say stuff, his music through his Julianos promotions. Julian, 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 yes, promotions. Yes. So if you if you are familiar with how those algorithms and stuff work um, mm-hmm. with social media, Julian's has created this vacuum <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where he is the go to for everything mu- um, yeah. soca music on mm-hmm. YouTube, yeah. and all these artists are pushing these things to him. And they are not getting any traction not, on their again, websites or even their own YouTube channels because they're not posting anything there. They're sending everything to him. Now, granted, that is his business. That is what mm-hmm. he does. That's fine. But at the same time, while you're posting there, you need to post on yours too and share. Yes. You know, share from do yours. Don't share from Julian's because yeah. you're just sending all the traffic to him and you're not able to build. So when they think about, oh, I can't monetize my YouTube. How come I not get any millions of hits? It's because you're not sending any traffic your mm. way. Exactly. So how do you expect to be able? And that to comes do into that? comes down to content creation. A lot of artists don't understand. It's not just you are the star. You have fans. So why wouldn't you create content? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a song that you have produced. You know, it could be a session in the studio that right. you just put up on 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 fa- on, on YouTube. Right. It, it could be anything. Just engaging with your fans. You create content, and that builds up your subscriber base. Exactly. Yeah. So it it brings me back to my 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 original point. Are we putting the card before the horse? Did, do we need to really just dial it back and really educate artists about the business of music before we start trying to attract tourists and develop, you know, <laughs> <laughs> develop a live music district? Or is it that through these things, we are discovering what needs to be done and trying to do that simultaneously? I, I think the latter. I think the latter because the live music district definitely has brought to light some of the the challenges that need to be addressed <laughs> um and where the gaps are within the music industry itself um and to be fair most of the artists in the live music district that's performing um are either very green or somewhat seasoned so they aren't the live music district does not cater for in in this instance right now the best of the best because 
the one, the venues. <laughs> it comes back to payment mm -hmm. and payment structures. Probably when the live music district takes off completely, you know, in how much ever years to come where the ven where the um private sector decides, okay, well yes, you know, we, we see um opportunity in this, then yes, the other's gonna come. Or I hear that what is the name of this hotel? Is it Hard Rock? Right. So Hard Rock's entire basis and premise is on music. So we know they're definitely going to be a hopping live music spot. Mm -hmm. So hopefully <laughs> that sort of triggers some sort of trend or the others realize, oh, okay, there is a business model that, 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 that's happening all over the world here that we can follow as a venue in order to generate income where live music is concerned. So hopefully, you know, something sparks <laughs> somewhere. I, I have been, as I said, um, this, strategic plan that the ministry has which i've seen there is the the company that set it up has this thing about creating music cities and i guess a live music district yeah. is a kind of a subset of a music city as it was but um i know two live music districts that have been well music cities famously new orleans where i've been mm -hmm. and parts of washington dc where i lived actually and there's a, a strip there they have every club has a, right. a live music and thing and admittedly, you don't necessarily have the best, you don't have big name performers there. They're all, right. you know, low level Most performers. Most of them are green Independent performers artists and, and that kind yep. of stuff. Mm -hmm. But they're performers who seem to understand the business of music, right? And I keep returning to this point about the business of music. This is what this podcast is about, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess this is the reason death from Music TT. And just remember, before it was Music TT, it was TT and then mm -hmm. before there was ID Co and before that was Tidco. The state has always wanted the music industry to be one of those diversified, those economy, those economic Pillars activities. Pillars of diversification. There right. you go. That's, that's the fancy, that's the fancy <laughs> terminology. So that somewhere along the line, they always believed that this thing was able to generate revenue, which right. is part of their mandate, right? We've already kind of hinted that artists have to become companies. These companies have to pay taxes because we also know that revenue collection by the state is not by ticket sales. Mm -hmm. It's by taxes. Of right. by payroll taxes oh, or, or artist taxes. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's so so that the, the state's revenue is not from as I said, it's not from ticket sales, right? So that at the end of the day, if the artists are not part of the whole system of business of music, did the state over many iterations of and many different parties get it wrong or are they looking at something else? Because what is the business model they're using to say that okay, this is going to be a new diversified economy and the minister goes and says it's a tremendous success and the min both ministers finance and trade in the parliament said it's a tremendous success and let's deal with the real statistics and let's deal with what we have seen up through the pilot phase that we haven't got uptake by venues we haven't got an uh, an evolution or uh, uh, we're not ahead of the learning curve of terms of the business of engaging live music and, and bookings and that kind of stuff how what is the business so, model going forward? So let let let's be fair with the the venues and the uptake. In that three months of a pilot is not enough time to to assimilate and have a whole culture change towards something like this. Fair enough. It ne it needs a lot of time. Fair so enough. while we're saying yes, that was pilot phase one, whatever. Essentially, this entire year is going to be a pilot in it, in its own right. Cause mm -hmm. we need at least a year or two to try and, you know, really sift through mm -hmm. everything that's going on and make sense of it and get better at it along the way. So I, I think we're, we're going to try to do that. I mean, we've already seen what the challenges were for phase one. We try to address them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, phase two, I'm sure, is going to have its own challenges. We will try to address that and just try to get better with it um, at each round. Are you all doing data collection? Because that is something that I've also wondered about in terms of the modern music industry. It's a lot about data and metadata. What is Music TT's role in terms of collecting data to make business decisions that are actually data-driven as opposed to Will it sound like a good idea? Well, we do collect data from both for the live music district itself, for from both venues and the artists. Um, we've had um, sit down talk sessions with the venues itself and get live that live feedback from them. We've yeah. had the questionnaire forms um, for both artists and for venues as well. So we're constantly trying to monitor every time the artist performs at a venue. Venues give us feedback on those artists. 
um, what worked, what didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So we're constantly looking at that information to see, you know, what, what road we should take next in terms of trying to better it. That's good. Um, y'all happy with the budget y'all got? Asking oh, controversial questions. I don't care. <laughs> I have to ask a question. The budget we got is the budget we got. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> I'm not going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was outside of the, the live music district. Um, music TT last year was so announced some other initiatives. Um, there was supposed to be the development of a, a website that you could, um, track music. Was it, what was it, Nigel, to track? That is the BMAT, the media monitoring website. Right, the media yeah. monitoring right. website. Yeah. And you were doing artist development. You had a showcase. You selected some artists to, to be part the of that program. The artist portfolio right. development program. Right. What is the status of those two things? So the BMAT website has been completed for some time now. Um, however, there has been technical glitches with it that we need to work out. Who's in what? terms of the... that That's just a tech thing, is a tech thing okay, all right. <laughs> that's, that's api and coding and right. <laughs> things that i can't explain <laughs> mm, so um so they have some technical glitches which we are working on with the company to get that done so you know the bmat website is there we could actually see stuff but we can't release it yet because it's not being linked to the other major site overall so um so when we sort that out public will have that information <laughs> so the media monitoring that that is supposed to be done that is what um tracking which so, songs are played on so radio yes it's tracking the radio plays cot actually uses um media monitoring yeah um in order to understand their payments and stuff structures There's also a private sector and their company that does it too. for the purposes of advertisers though what is like what's what songs are played and who plays one and that kind of stuff but as you rightly said cut does it and i know bmat was i think it's a barcelona technical institute kind of thing yeah. they had developed a software that does this tracking which is utilized by a number of cmos globally and thing so you said that how music tt was developing that website to do what to check to see that cut and ttc one or some no we, 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 we were not doing that we were just making it readily available to the artists so that they can log on at any point in time and see where they fall within the charts because the way that system is set up you can change it to different views mm -hmm. so you can see what the monthly plays were like this that the other because some artists have the impression that their songs are playing hundreds and hundreds of times all over and they're not getting any money for it and oh. yada yada not understanding how the sampling for cmos work in terms of payment structures mm -hmm. so they are able to go on the site and see what is what where do they fall within that ranking and how many times songs were played oh. interesting and the the, the artist portfolio development where is that? So the APDP is at a stage where these 10 artists have completed voice training with Vanessa Briggs. So you're really teaching um, voice training then? We're not teaching. They need some areas to... They had Fine some tuning. refining, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we put them through, you know, some rigorous voice training. And Vanessa Briggs was absolutely amazing. They completed performance training mm. with Glenda Collins. Um, why mm -hmm. performance? Because some of them we realize just don't know how to use the stage and they don't know what to do with their bodies. They don't know what to do with their face. They just blank. <laughs> so, you know, and Glenda is amazing. <laughs> she is awesome. I know. So her. she really had them going, going, going. They were just sending us praises and thanks for, for, you know, what, what about, Glenda. what about writing bios? Cause I've, I've been reading they too many are bad working bios. On that with <laughs> <laughs> Nigel don't get me started with the bios, no? Um, <laughs> your, your music matters. You <laughs> can talk, man. <laughs> so, um, Josh Rudder, to, uh, Tova Music, mm -hmm. is actually, was actually the one concerning their branding and everything. So he focused on their social media branding mm -hmm. in terms of how it should look and tailoring that package. Um, he did some photo shoots with them because the selfies was not working. No, no. People, selfies are not for your electronic press kits. It is not for your website. <laughs> um, 
and he also worked on he's actually working on bios with them right now how how so, do you, how do you all pick these facilitators i know vanessa i know glenda i know josh but what is the process that music tt goes through are these put up for public tender it is not put up for public tender it is amongst ourselves okay we know of this person that person or the industry professionals recommend a certain people mm. and we of course have our procurement process which we have to follow government mm. three quotes yeah. system etc we put it out that way to them that, yeah. if they're interested they they send in a quote if they're not interested they don't send they move in a on. quote um tendering process takes really really long that's well, yeah. like i know they have soul tendering really, i know that's really a long. process that exists you could have literally when you pick one person because oh no that we, we haven't it. done that we haven't done that with any of these um facilities i guess if you're paving a highway or something so, so. <laughs> <laughs> and any any of the artists in this program have they been on the live music district circuit as well they are all required to be on the live music district circuit as part of their personal training in terms of interacting with audience and understanding mm -hmm. So they get to use their vocal training elements. They get to use what Glenda mm -hmm. taught them, mm -hmm. you know, and different angles of stuff. Um, they're also working with Barry Manette right now. I think they should finish next week with Barry mm -hmm. um, for music theory. And most importantly, understanding how to communicate with their musicians. What about um, what about interviews, live interviews? I mean, we have spoken, Laura and I have spoken to artists and they get all the um, um, um. Is that part and parcel of what you all are going to be training in terms of that artist development we can definitely look at that because that did not cross my mind to be quite be honest because we're in the era of well visuals obviously and podcasts and media and training radio and media with media training because it's very difficult watching morning programs some of these artists is, is hard so i don't know if that's part of well you say you're going to look at it so yeah <laughs> well I'll, the, I'll the APDP structure that idea. is going to change um for the next cohort we're taking them in in cohorts yeah. Um, so it is going to change a little bit from what it is right now, mm -hmm. um, especially with the level of artists that is involved, because we need those artists to be full time musicians. We need them to be, you know, just ready to take that mantle and run with it and work. Um, this set needs a lot more refining. Um, because they're very much still within that green slash crossover to intermediate kind of stage. Um, so it's a lot more work. And then with resources being limited, we can't afford to expend that much, um, money into that program. So we need to find another way to fine tune it. So we're going to work on that for the next cohort. And once the program so. is finished, what happens? Are they going to be sent out into the big world? So not all of them are Will they going be exported? To be, <laughs> not all of them are going to be shopped. Okay. Um so they all know Do they going know that? in, they all know going okay. in that they needed to uphold a certain standard, they needed to attend their classes, mm -hmm. they needed to be actively involved in all the different processes that we're laying out for them. Yeah. Um so and all the facilitators know that they needed to evaluate them all along the way in mm. terms of their attendance. Um, is their you know their drive making sure that you know they 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 see that passion and feed and fury and they mm. really want this. Um, so we're gonna go over all of that information with the facilitators, etc., so that we can then cut down as to who, who's who, who's who, get who. yep. Makes and sense. and they're going and they're going to be shopped to where um labels or just festivals events so it will be through a contacts basis so people that we have met along the way from labels and different stuff they have all expressed interest in the caribbean market so essentially we're going to be sending out things to these different people um, trying to get them on different stages and what would you be going to South by Southwest with women and um, Womex me them are those part part of the um we, plan going forward we don't have that in plans right now no okay money Nigel <laughs> money 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 they money, don't money, got money. money. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the money yes money. so money. when does this um current phase of the live music district come to an end the 16th of December Okay, and and it reopens after carnival, 
And is it going to be in Port of Spain still? Because, you know, in the budget, the minister said it's going to go national. National. He's turned really out that, out, that really was not the case. It's yeah. still in Port of Spain. So is it going to be, you know, spread out to the rest of the nation? Shagona, San Fernando, Tobago, what's happening? Tell us. So it, it, it will. We need to have a conversation with some of the south venues and east venues. So right now it's actually Port of Spain and environs. So we've extended to San Juan. We've extended to Shagaramas. So, um, oh, that's, that's new. Did not know that. <laughs> Good. Yeah. We've extended it outwards a little bit to involve some of the newer restaurants, especially Shagramas. They were like so eager for entertainment, um, mm. between sales, um, Bukharan, which mm-hmm. is the new, the new face, yeah, place, by the boardwalk, right? yeah. uh, Zanzibar, Shagramas as well. Mm. Um, so, um, but it it has expanded beyond the Port of Spain. It has one expanded district. a little bit beyond the Port of Spain district. So mm-hmm. we're 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 terming it as Port of Spain and environs. Mm-hmm. Um, we're hoping to with for the next for the rest of the year for 2019 fiscal that we're able to visit eastern, central, and south, etc. So um. So you want we'll a bigger see. budget so you could do more things then. I just threw that thing <laughs> just off, off, off left hook because what I'm getting, what I'm getting from what you're saying is that you have limited budget and as a consequence, you could do so many things, right? With that budget. But, um, the idea is a good idea, but for these ideas to make sense, you have to spend a little more money, which we don't have. But, um, <laughs> one, one step at a time. This is a shout out to the Minister of Finance. We need more money. More money. But more what, money. but what I'm also getting is that eventually music TT, will not be the facilitator for this. Like eventually it will be the artist and the and the venue. And right. they can take this so, and run with it. So what we tell the venues even from now and the artists as well is that we have funding periods. So these phases are essentially funding periods mm. for music TT. Mm. They can still use the platform that we've provided for them outside of that. They just won't be paid by music TT. They and the venue need to negotiate, mm, to negotiate that. Yes. So they can still use it. We can still facilitate that process later on, even if the private sector says, oh yeah, we're taking it on. That could be our contribution mm-hmm. because essentially we, we can't, we can't set up ourselves to be an agent. We can't, mm-hmm. you know, do that. That, mm-hmm. that is too much on us to do that. Um, but we could facilitate that process by providing the infrastructure and the technology for it. So they're free to use it after and outside of the phases. Nice. So Melissa, this has been an eye opener and air air opening because you've been very honest and I thank you for your honesty in terms of giving us the information about what is happening and what is not happening at Music TT and more importantly, what is happening or not happening in the state's intervention in the music industry vis-a-vis LMD, music, artist development and all that kind of stuff. Um, Thank you for being here. I don't know if Laura has anything thank to say. Thank you for having me. Well, no, thank you for coming. We, it's, it's good for us to have, to have had this follow up. Mm-hmm. It was you necessary. know, so just people wouldn't just think we are haters out here. Yes. <laughs> but we are so yeah. passionate yeah, about yeah. the development of music in the Caribbean that we want to see, we want this thing to work. Yeah. And it's good to know what is, what is, you know, the state we are in, what we, where, where needs work, where, where you know, mm-hmm. and the gaps that need to be filled. And hopefully the powers that be are listening. So that they pump this some more money this. into music, Titi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they know how to take this thing forward. Melissa, thank you so much thank for you. agreeing to come on Music Matters, the Caribbean edition. No problem. Thank you very much. It. And <laughs> hopefully we'll have you here again, maybe when we talk about Parang. <laughs> that is that is an inside, inside joke. joke. That is an inside, inside joke. joke. <laughs> so we won't, <laughs> we won't worry about that. Nigel, this was truly a very enlightening conversation, and I'm glad so. we we did it. And I'm, I'm appreciative of the honesty, and I'm appreciative of the fact that somebody from a state-owned enterprise was able to come and have a frank and open conversation without being hindered or cut in style. So I, I really am I'm very happy about that. That just me based on what I've heard from other state-owned enterprise heads. This has been an enlightening conversation, and I'm very happy that we had Melissa here. And all I can say is we look forward to see what happens in Live Music District and all the activities that Music TT has going forward. Yes. So, once again, thank you everybody for listening to us. I am Nigel Campbell. I'm Laura Dowridge Phillips and you've been listening to Music Matters. The Caribbean Edition. Bye. Bye.